Welcome to Not Quite Magic, a Seven Sisters podcast about interpreters. I'm Elena Langdon, and for this first season, I'm talking to interpreters in a variety of settings and from around the world about remote interpreting. For every interview we launch, the Seven Sisters will then host a live debriefing of the issues raised. Stay tuned for the end of this episode for details on how to join us. In this episode, I spoke to Melissa Mann, an English, Spanish, and Portuguese conference interpreter, voiceover talent, and certified translator based in São Paulo, Brazil. She built a dedicated home studio for her work, and we spoke about why she chose to invest in remote simultaneous interpreting, what are the ideal working conditions, and the different conference interpreting markets in Brazil and the U.S. We had a lot of fun talking, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Thank you for agreeing to to be interviewed for this podcast. Um, I'm so happy to have you. Uh, The first question, which I actually didn't give you ahead of time because it's a new question that Laura proposed, (laughs) um, is what, because the name of the podcast is going to be Not Quite Magic, and this is based on on something very personal to me that has to do with interpreting and living between two languages and two places. But I wanted to hear from you, and this could be about anything in your life. What does seem like magic to you? What What is magic to me? Um, nature. I love everything green and growing. So, and I am, I am always in awe of nature. And I, I live out in the boondocks, surrounded by very lush, beautiful. Atlantic forest in Brazil. And that for me is magic and I get to see it every day. Melissa, what's the short version of what you tell potential clients about what you do as an interpreter? Uh, It depends on the client. So if it's a client who has no idea about what anything related to languages is, I will explain that what we do is facilitate communication between languages. And that can be live, that can be on paper, that can be pre-recorded, post-recorded, all sorts of stuff. That's the simple version. And then if they know what they want, if they come and say, hey, I need an interpreter, I, I don't have to explain anything. I just have to walk them through sometimes um, some of the logistics involved in the interpreting process. So it really depends on the clients. I'll give them a more detailed explanation if they have no idea what they've heard, what I do and a very simple explanation or maybe just consulting work if they know what interpreting is, but they just need help putting putting it together for their event. Languages that you work with, and since when have you been working as an interpreter? I work with English, Spanish, and Portuguese. I try to avoid working solely between Spanish and Portuguese, so I like to keep English in the mix. Oh, I started working as an interpreter many years ago and then I took time off. So I I think I started 20 years ago as an interpreter in Mexico, took a bunch of time off and then got back into interpreting when I moved to Brazil. No, it was after I moved to Brazil. (laughs) And how did you, how did you get into it when you, when you first started and then back into it again? Okay, so I started out as a, a translator, and that was that was by chance. So I moved to Mexico. I met the person who then became my business partner, and she was a lawyer by trade. And she, I had done a little bit of volunteer translating before that, and then she had always wanted to get into translating. She had already taken some classes, and we said, you know what, let's let's do this. Um, and we started doing legal translations and she taught me everything I know, <laughs> but at least for that part of my, so I started with just legal and business. And, um, and the reason I got into interpreting was twofold. Um, so one of our written clients called me in and I had said, look, I, I had never done this. They said, that's fine. We'll, we'll work with you. And, and I was hooked. So that, that was that mm-hmm. I was also, um, I was also somewhere in, in Mexico once and the 
interpreter didn't show up at a simultaneous event. <laughs> and I happened to be around doing other stuff, uh, doing consulting work. And they pulled me and said, can you, can you do interpreting? And I said, um, no, sure, but I've never done this. So the person who was with me at the time, great guy, and he said, well, I'll just, you do five, 10 minutes and I'll do 30 minutes. And, um, and that was it. So between those two, I was completely hooked. And then I just started taking courses left, right, and center and, and working and doing whatever I could. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was, it was, I, I learned very much on the job and there were some, there were some problems with that, which I recognized later when I came to, I came to Brazil. How did I get back to, so I, when I left Mexico, I said, all right, I've forsworn interpreting, translating. I want out of this business totally. And I took some time off and then I finally said, you know, no, I really love it. <laughs> what was I, what was I thinking? I missed it. So I slowly made my way back in and I realized I had to learn some new skills when I was here in, in, in Brazil. So I learned um, for the translating side, I learned how to do uh, cat tools and, and be more resourceful. And then for interpreting, I, I had a lot of practice. I, I, I realized I was, I was very, um, I think I was getting by on the seat of my pants. I realized how novice I had been in Mexico. So I started practicing a lot when I got here and I got, you know, two, three jobs for like in six months. And then I slowly built it up, built it up. And now, now I'm quite content with where I am. And did you take any of the any of the training programs in Brazil? I did get a degree, but unfortunately, that's not where I learned. Where, where <laughs> I really learned was my deliberate practice study group. And then I studied with Danny Fonseca, who runs a lot of training programs down here. I did CCIC in um, Cambridge. I did collab with Laura, which is awesome. And I think is by far the best training program I've ever done bar camps and week-long prep courses and online prep courses. I have a list somewhere. I'll send you the list. But yes, there were lots and lots of courses. And I made sure that every, oh, I took Epic. Epic is a course down here. Um, I did HIT. HIT was a course. Both of those were week-long intensives. Yep. Lots yeah. of them. Yes, yeah. Lots of courses. <laughs> yeah. No, and that's, that's what, that's what, I find a lot of um, a lot of people have done if you if you don't have access to a good, you know, conference interpreting master's program, which there are so few of them to begin with, <laughs> and many of us can't. Well, can't, I don't have this access. This is to a them. this was a major issue. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But this is a major issue. I wanted a master's degree. By the time I realized I wanted a piece of paper, um, I couldn't do the available master's programs because I would have. I, I couldn't afford to just walk away from my clients and my and my setup as it was. So I was forced to find summer programs, week-long programs, these intensives. I, I actually looked into Glendon, which was great for one year I could do, but then I couldn't say goodbye clients and everybody. I'm just going to go up to Canada for a year. So unfortunately, the master's programs, which are phenomenal, there are some really phenomenal ones out there. You've got to be early on in your career. It's really got to be before you've got clients or at a point where you say I'm willing to step away but you're you're going to take a dip right right the trade-off it's a trade-off yeah yeah how would you describe to somebody you know who's in the field uh, for the audience of the podcast that knows about interpreting what you do because all of us do you know we work in different settings we provide different packages of services I, I wear three hats I'm a voiceover artist I'm a written translator and I'm an interpreter. And when I'm doing interpreting, it's, I'd say 90% 90, 90 of the time, it's simultaneous interpreting at on site or remote events. And then the other 10% are things like consecutive or very occasionally liaison, which is where I'm kind of following somebody around and uh, half interpreting, half explaining, half babysitting. I don't know, not there, that's a lot of halves, but a little of everything. 
but that's that's probably about three percent of what I do and then the rest is is a small bit is consecutive and the rest is simultaneous which is uh, pretty much at the same time as you hear incoming audio you produce outgoing audio in another language for the benefit of those who don't speak the language or don't understand the original audio language and and you do this in in conference and business settings correct i mostly do it in conference settings so events of all types could be board meet everything from board meetings or even high level C-suite meetings with three people, uh, all the way to large events with 6,000 attendees and, and everything in between. So that's most of what I do. And then occasionally there are uh, factory visits or other business settings where I might be called in, but it's, it's mostly events, corporate events in general. And how, um, how much do you travel? For the, you know, for the stuff that you're doing on site? A fair bit. So I, I would say I, well, taking this year out of the equation, um, I would say I do about 120 days a year of interpreting, the 100, 120, 130 days a year of interpreting. Of that, um, I want to say 60, 70% is in Sao Paulo or greater Sao Paulo. So that's my base. Um, and I have a small apartment there. So that's kind of home base. The rest is traveling mostly throughout Brazil and every once in a while abroad. What's the percentage of work that you do that's remote right now? Of the interpreting work, what percentage of it is remote? Well, now it's 100% remote and <laughs> um, <laughs> it's 100% remote. Uh, last year, probably about 20% was remote. It, it really started to take off last year. Um, and and, and kind of concentrated towards the end of the year. And then this year, it's just maybe even more last year, 20 to 25%. And then, and then this year, it's just 100% remote. Right. I've seen a change in the type of events that are remote, though. Um, because before, you'd see it'd be large conferences, large international conferences and occasionally a high level meeting where someone could not fly in from Germany. Um, this year, it's a 50-50 mix of, of, of kind of conferences and meetings and um, kind of educational seminars or workshops. Talking about remote, how did that can you talk a little bit about how that started to come into the picture, why, and, and what that looked like? So that came into the picture purely because I do voiceover work. So I started voiceover, um, I started studying voice acting about four years ago and, and took tons and tons of courses in Brazil, online. I have a coach in the U.S. And then at some point I said, you know what, I'm tired of using my friend's studio, which is a great studio and she's a great friend, but... I need a place of my own. So I built up a studio for me and it's, it's soundproof and it's great. And then I said, well, wait a second, I've got this soundproof studio. It doesn't take too much more to outfit it for remote interpreting. So I outfitted it for remote interpreting. And then for a while I was just sitting there waiting for jobs to just magically appear. And I realized that's not exactly how it works. I had to and I'm still working on this, but I had to go out and say, hey, people, I've got this remote interpreting and uh, remote simultaneous interpreting studio. So if you need a remote interpreter, please consider me. Could you talk about something that you really, that you feel that remote added to it? And, you know, again, this is even before you've been forced to do all remote, but at the time, you know, you said, why not set it up? Because I already have the, the, the studio there. Was it, did you feel that there was, that it was something that would work particularly well in a certain situation or that was giving you something you weren't getting from in-person on site? No, I just felt like, no, I just felt like this is the future. It's going this way. I could see the signs and it was, it was very clear writing on the wall. And I said, I'm just going to be ready for it. And that was kind of how I, 
how I fell into it. And I realized that, again, you have to promote yourself. You have to let people know that you have um, a good studio. Also, don't let people know that you have a good studio if you don't have a good studio. It doesn't take too much to set up a good studio, but gosh darn it, do it right. Um, I guess that goes for anything in life, right? Don't sell yourself as a, a fantastic interpreter if you still have a lot of studying to do. Same thing. You you saw the writing on the wall, which um, a lot of people a lot of people didn't see. <laughs> um, and well, I, I didn't see I didn't see coronavirus on the wall. That was no. yeah, right. That was crazy. But I did see the writing on the wall that things are going to go digital. Because I saw that, I also didn't. I don't see, I, I think I feel so many people are panicking right now. We need remote interpreting. Everyone's got to be remote interpreting. The future is only remote interpreting. We're all going to remote interpret. And I, it's also very clear to me that, no, this is, this is going to run parallel or t together with in-person jobs. But we're, if anything I've seen out of this is that people are clamoring for regular old in-person events. So I don't see the end of that. Uh, that's the other writing on the wall, but that's it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, I, I mean, I think a lot of us are, are saying that it's like, if, if, <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to get on the computer anymore. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, I've been, and I, you know, I, I have a nice home office and I've been, you know, and I teach and I interpret and I, but I used to interpret, you know, face to face too, but it, you know, even even just socializing, I've been trying to socialize online, and I can't get most of my friends to do it because they're just like I'm too, you know, zoomed out. It's like I can't get in front of another <laughs> computer. I hear you. I took off today. I was I said I'm not working today, so this is the first. This is why I had difficulty getting on, but I came on just now because I had I was just screened out, and I said I just got to do physical something. So I'm gardening and stuff like that today, just to. Yeah get it out of my system <laughs> and and you might have said this already or or hinted at it but is there ever, ever a time that you feel that remote interpreting is actually the best solution is remote interpreting the best solution um you know in a particular setting or a particular yes, type okay of, you know? i think yes okay so remote interpreting is the best solution when you either have a last minute or a pretty urgent meeting and it's logistically and financially prohibitive to bring the participants to, to do, on a plane to wherever moving things around. So that's an excellent situation. Um, I can see where it would be excellent for webinars where people kind of come in and out, not, not those short webinars, but actually the all day online conferences, but where people come in and out based on the webinar they want to hear or the speaker they want to listen to. That's a great situation too, where it's really a kind of a multinational, but you don't have to be there all day paying attention, taking notes. So those two are great situations. And then standard webinars, one hour, one hour webinars, one or two speakers, a bunch of audience members, probably not asking questions. That's also a great setup. So those I think where remote is even better. Everything else, probably not. So what are some situations where it would really be a nightmare or it's just really not suited? I will give you an example of something that happened in December to me where I, I was ready to tear my hair out. I was hired uh, by, I was hired by a language service provider who had been hired by the company. This was an all in-person event, three languages, Portuguese, Spanish, English, in the US. But they wanted their interpreters, they didn't want to fly their interpreters to the event, so it was a two or three day event and we were remote. Great. Um, that made it nearly impossible to to get a feeling for what was going on. I mean, everybody was there personally and just the interpreters were these hidden voices coming out of people's headsets. So that was one element that made it extremely frustrating. The other element is that was terrible was the, the person on site who was responsible for getting us the audio, uh, the video feed and audio feed 
had no idea what our needs were as interpreters. So insisted on sitting on the side of the room to be more inconspicuous. But that was terrible because there was no, there was very little visuals. And there was a point where we didn't even have the slides, the guy spewing out numbers. We couldn't see what was going on. And I, and uh, if you can see the charts, even if you can't see the numbers in the charts, you could tell growth or decline, or you can, you can put together a story if you have some visuals, but we had no visuals, not even the speaker was clear enough. That was problem number two. Problem number three was that they had set up two pure booths with no interaction between the booths, not even for relay, and no way to go back into the other language, period. Oh. So th this was extremely frustrating because the people participating really, they wanted to ask questions. So what did they, they were forced to ask questions. Someone on site did their best version of a consecutive translation, but they're not professional translators. So they were stuck doing that. I couldn't hear, I was in the Portuguese English booth. I couldn't hear what was going on in the Spanish booth which is fine, I, I speak Spanish, so it was fine for me. They were dependent on us, or would have been dependent on us, but because there was no relay or no interaction between the booths, we couldn't hear each other, they, they were forced to do this on the fly, interpreting someone local, interpreting all the questions, which really made everybody there very frustrated because there was, they lost that element of being able to interact comfortably in their own languages. And it forced a, a number of people whose English was, say, less than stellar or who just didn't feel comfortable using English, to, to, it just forced them to be quiet, which goes against the nature of, communicate, of good communication. So that was a situation that I think was just exemplary of all the things that should, that all the things that need to be taken into account when you do remote interpreting. You need to understand the logistics of the booth. You need to understand the logistics of the participants and the speakers. You need to understand the, the visual needs of the interpreters. And all of this has to be communicated to every person involved in, in the general setup of this event. And when, and, and, and the client's paying a lot of money for this. So I, I'm sitting here wondering, um, how it is that the, in this case, the language service provider didn't want to go to bat for the interpreter's needs. And that was just a, a it was a great lesson for me. And it's an excellent lesson for when I'm, the, when I'm directly working between the client and, and other interpreters, everything that needs to be explained and also where I draw the line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's a really good example. And I, and the, the first part, reminded me of a of an interesting um, paper that Barbara Moser Mercer wrote about the effect of presence in interpreting and it was it was looking at people that were interpreters that were starting to to work remotely and how they you know they felt like just like you described they weren't part of the event you know they were mm -hmm. And that idea of, of being present, you know, everybody mm -hmm. else was gathering and they weren't affected. I think, um, and I'd have to look back, but I think it, it, it was, it really affected their fatigue levels mm -hmm. um, and, and their satisfaction. You know, they were just oh, like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Different from, I just I recently, very recently did um, a two day conference. It was an actual conference <laughs> in the middle of this. Obviously everybody was remote and it was phenomenal. It went it just went off without a hitch. And I think it was, there obviously is a fatigue level. There's a lot of mental, uh, there's a heavy mental load when you do remote interpreting. But I think everybody, by virtue of the fact that everybody was remote, uh, everybody was willing to put in 110% and did actually put in 110%. And, and when there were issues, we were able to bring them up directly with the client sometimes even say through the, hey, we can't hear the speaker. And it was, it was, it was great rapport. And, and the participants were also appreciative because, because they were also remote. So that element, I, I know that hybrid events can happen with interpreters remotely and everybody else in person, but I, I will henceforth, well, ever, ever since that event, I, I have said, I don't want to do it that way. It's, it's, 
and even if I do a great job, I feel like I'm shortchanging the the end client. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. It 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 really it's almost like the culture of the event. And so if you have an event that's all remote and also even the culture of what's happening right now, you know, that this moment that we're in where we, this is, this is all we have. This is the only contact we have with other people. So everyone is in the same boat, you know, everybody's remote and they're all aware of that. So you have, you know, the speakers, the tech people, everyone is, a, is aware that they have to do their best for this new thing. Whereas if it's a hybrid event, you know, the speakers and, and the audience or some mm -hmm. of the audience, because it could even be, you know, or are in a different thing, you know, kind of thinking that the interpreting and the, or the, you know, well, the interpreting is just, just an added little thing there, you know, kind of like the coffee break or something. You, you have the coffee in the corner, you have the interpreting coming in and, it doesn't, but no, I, I think it's, it's that shared culture of what we're in this for, you know, who's my audience, who's my speaker, which the true communication, that's, that's what you need. You know, you need to understand mm -hmm. where everyone. I think you could liken it to, I mean, to explain it if, if a client is having a difficult time understanding and that client can be the, again, the client, the company, it could be a language service provider. It could be a fellow interpreter if that's the person who's hiring you i liken it to those in-person events where they have the speaker on skype from germany right and okay they they bring in the audio they manage to do it the tech guys the guys in the house they're doing an amazing job they're miracles practically but it's stressful even for people that speak the language of the 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 lecturer, they, they understand guys talking in, in English, they speak English, whatever it is. It's stressful. The, the sound is, uh, is, well, it's just not a clean sound. And it stresses everybody out, even for the monolingual, for monolingual communication. And so I, I try to liken it to that, that you, in, in, a, in a normal in-person event, you want to avoid having more than one or two guest speakers calling in from some other country. It's the same thing. Why would you want to have an all-in-person event and just your interpreters outside? It, right. It's very disrupting to the, just to the, I guess, how kind of clean and smooth the whole thing feels. So you talked a little bit about the fatigue element of remote interpreting. Do you find that you're switching, do you going in shorter stints with your booth mate? Uh, or you feel that you're more or less tired after the end of the day? Any, any changes with, with that? I don't, no, I do, I do half an hour. I mean, unless the person asks to, to, for 20 minutes, I will, but I, my preference is, is half an hour. Um, do I feel more tired? A little bit, the, the studio is, dark so I, although I guess I guess booths are pretty dark too um, I, I think I feel slightly more tired with remote interpreting but it's not a very noticeable difference um, it depends and the times where I felt considerably more tired it's because the elements were not in the right elements were not in place so when the right elements are in place it's only slightly more tiring and it and really is a minor bit. But, mm -hmm. but if you're missing any of those critical elements, visuals, a good booth mate, communication between the booths, if there are multiple languages, the ability to go back and forth if you need to, easy communication with the client, if any of those elements are missing, um, yeah, it's, it's just going to be, it's going to be exhausting. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, that one event that I told you about that was just hell, the, the, the shining light, the saving grace was that I had a phenomenal booth mate, a phenomenal booth mate who was paying attention the whole time. I don't think, I don't think the guy went for a bathroom break. He was just phenomenal. And that really, that really helped. And, and especially for that one part where the guy was just going off with numbers and we had no visuals whatsoever. He was there listening just to make sure that, just to help me with whatever numbers, just to make sure that I was catching, or, or between the two of us, someone was catching what needed to be caught. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but yeah, so, so the exhaustion element is, the ex exhaustion is what comes from not having all of the right elements in place. Right. Period. That's and, my sum, and, summary statement. And that can happen anywhere. I mean, you, I work in a much grayer market um, and, you know, all kinds of events where they just, there's just nothing um, set up well for the interpreter. And, you know, you go and it's like this big cathedral ceiling lecture hall and you're listening to the, the speaker from the same, you know, the same speakers that all the, everyone else is listening to the presenter and, you know, interpreting into the little, little tour guide system. And then you're putting your hands on <laughs> them. Wow. You don't bother anybody. Yeah. It's, it's, um, uh, <laughs> and, and that's just awful and it's exhausting and, and you never, if you know, you're not doing, you know, you're not doing a good job. Um, I want to hear more about that. <laughs> I'm actually, because this is bizarre. I just keep talking about myself and I am, as, as I keep talking, I'm like, I want to know about, do you do the same thing? What, what's your story? My focus lately has been, um, with tr just trying to do what a lot of other people are doing, which is trying to get my own clients. And then you can, you can <laughs> bring them on board. And I, I was able to, co to convince a client to go from the, you know, tour guide system with no booth, even though it was three languages in the meeting, um, to at least a half booth and simultaneous. And I said, look, it, it is going to cost more for the equipment, but you're going to love it. And they loved it. And it was like, this is oh. an example of, you know, they loved it because they had discussions. They had people that spoke English and Portuguese and French, and they before had mm -hmm. to do it all in consecutive with us, you know, for the relay. Right. And, and suddenly it was like, no, anybody can talk at any moment and you don't have to wait for the interpreters. And, so, right. and, and it was the whole thing was, it was an employee meeting and it was engagement. Mm -hmm. People had traveled from other countries. So, so that, that really worked, but no, <laughs> this, you don't want to hear the horror stories. <laughs> um, no, I'm curious actually, cause it's, it's strangely, I was born and raised in the U S but I never, that was never my market. I, I started working after I left the U S. So I'm, I'm, I'm very curious and I recognize that it's very much a, um, a language service providers age slash agency market. Yes. Yeah. Here in Brazil, it's slowly moving that way, but the, the, the interpreters still are strong. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and, and, and you have good organizations, you know, like IEC just doesn't have any penetration here. You know, it just, it's, it's right. not relevant, um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know, and so, I mean, in, you know, in Massachusetts, there aren't any, I, there's one IEC interpreter for, for Spanish. Um, and then there's mm -hmm. a pre-candidate. As far as I know, that's it. There's, there's nobody for Portuguese. As interpreters in Brazil, your relationship, actually, this is kind of crazy. Your relationship with your booth mate can be a number of different things. It can, you can be the person who hired that booth mate. You can be hired by that booth mate. You could both be hired by some outside person. Um, and at the same time, you have to work together. So you're, you have to help each other. So you've got all these kind of different relationships going. And at the same time, you've got this, however you worked out the payment system with whoever hired you, or if it's your client, how you're doing the payments. And it's, I mean, there are just so many factors coming into that, that have nothing to do with the actual interpreting itself. Nothing right. with the skill set of interpreting. It's all about the marketing or the, the financial dynamics or the market dynamics, or it, it, yeah. I, I think about yeah. this often. And I, don't I, know the, I don't know the solution. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 you know, you, you might not feel like you know the solution, but I think it's really, it's good to talk to interpreters in other places because you have mm -hmm. done a lot of the work and you're doing a lot of the work and it's refreshing and it's, it's, it's a good thing for us to hear, you know, because it is possible. Um, so, you know, it, it, you might feel like you don't have the solution, but in fact, things are, and, and of course, some of it does have to do with this whole fear of price fixing, you know, which, mm -hmm. which in Brazil prices are set, <laughs> right? I mean, they're, they're, there are, there are, there are, they're not, but they are. Yeah, there's officially kind of they're not, but there's a, but isn't that, you know, there's the tables and at least for, and for translation, it is, if you're doing certified translations, so everything kind of, you know, comes from there. Right. The associate, which doesn't preclude people from charging whatever the heck they want. But I particularly use those matrices to 
um, when I deal with my clients, I said, this is the reference. This is the kind of market reference and I'm charging either the market reference or more or whatever I'm charging. But I use that as a tool for my, uh, for my clients. Right. But people charge, people, do, people do charge whatever the heck they want. You talked a little bit about it, but I want to talk a little bit more about the idea of loving the work that you do and kind of your relationship with that between, especially because you mentioned that you took a break from it and went back to it because you realized that that's what you really love. Um, okay. I love what I do. Uh, I think I also love what I do because they're the three different elements of what I do. So I do different types of communication and I, I don't get overloaded by just one specific type. Um, and I, and I, love, I love languages, I love dancing around with them. I love the ability to play with the language when I'm translating, I really find the perfect solution. I love the joy of interpreting the text when I'm doing voiceover work. And I love the challenge of coming up with fast solutions to have immediate communication in, in the simultaneous interpreting world. So all of those really just, it's just fun for me. I left my job, I left, my, I left the field completely and then came back to it because uh, when I was, when I left Mexico, I at the time was working with my business partner and then there were a number of people in the business all of them were at a very different stage in life. Um, they were all moms, working moms. I mean, everyone was working, but working moms. So they were, and they all kind of come to this conclusion where I'm going to work X amount and that's all I want. And no, I don't really want to grow the business. Nobody really wanted to learn the tools that were out there. Nobody was really doing the ongoing education or anything like that courses. And so I felt almost stagnant and I felt like this isn't, this wasn't the right fit for me, but it took me a while to realize that I had just, I threw out the baby with the bathwater. I said, I hate this. I don't like interpreting. I don't like translating. This is awful. I'm out of here. And then I realized, no, no, no. What I didn't like was that particular setup. And I, not ironically, but interestingly, my former business partner, who's a dear friend, she also kind of came to this conclusion. She was also stressed out with the, with the setup for different reasons. And then she decided to just, we had this kind of, the company was quite big and she just, she just reduced it completely and said, you know, I just want to do these boutique translations. I don't want to advertise that she, so she changed the nature of it too, before, fortunately she was not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, but she, we both realized that um, you don't necessarily have to, how should I put this? I think we, we both realized that the essence of what we were doing was, was very much enjoyable, was, was, was very satisfactory and, and, um, and brought us both just a lot of, just a lot of pleasure and yeah, pleasure and satisfaction. And that, that you can change how it's done so that you absolutely ensure that. That said, every job's gonna have a part of it that's utterly annoying that you're gonna hate doing, I don't know, the back office work and the calling, sending out invoices and that kind of stupid stuff. But that's kind of think that's unavoidable. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. So now we're going to do the, the rapid fire. <laughs> so you, you're prepared, unlike some of my guests. <laughs> so you have a hands up on that. Right. Um, so notepad or a digital pad? Ooh. Uh, notepad, I have used a digital pad and it's on my list of I want to totally go digital. I've used both. I love the digital. I need a new digital pad and it's on the next time I get to the States, I will buy this. But go um, digital. That, yeah, go digital. Go digital. Coffee or tea? Both. <laughs> um, any, do you have any special object or totem that you take with you when you interpret? No. Do I? Um, I do not. Okay. It's <laughs> the usual. <laughs> um, what about freelance or in-house? 
That's not true. That's not true. I, I always take throat lozenges. I always have throat lozenges in my bag. Okay. <laughs> um, do you, what about freelance or in-house? Oh, freelance. I mean, yay, yay for in-house translators. And I've done that before. Um, but, oh my God, it's so stifling. No, <laughs> it's not for me. Uh, and I, yeah, some of these answers, I think I know. So consecutive or simultaneous? Oh, I love them both. I know I'm that weirdo that loves them both. Um, and is there a term or, I don't know, a category or something that kind of always trips you up when you're interpreting or that you, you know, trips you up more than, more than you want to admit? Yeah, there are some words that I always screw. Actually, okay, so <laughs> it's not terms that, but I can never remember if they're female or male. And um, so for whatever reason, and I, so there, yeah, so there are a bunch of words that are female, male that I have to write down before every event. Uh, interface, nose, nose because it's different in Spanish and in Portuguese. And there are three like that. And then, and this is ridiculous because I do medical, but <laughs> I have to keep this little, this little list of, of um, uh, kidneys, what is it? Uh, kidneys versus liver and all the words that are associated with them, like, you know, nephro versus renal versus, and for whatever reason, so I don't confuse them, I have to keep these little lists. So I have my little cheat sheet and it's on the corner of my computer and I look at it before every event, period. Yeah, that's, and that's exactly why I wanted to ask the question because I think it's, it's interesting what each of us does. And, you know, when I teach it, students are, you know, always worried about not knowing. It's like, there's, there's that for everyone at any level. You know, I have for medical, mm -hmm. I cannot say, and I, I have to write it out, microbio. <laughs> I say microbio mm -hmm. half the time. <laughs> it's like, no, microbio. It's like one of the, I know it's going to trip me up, you know. And there was some event where we had two compounds or something that were slightly different. You know, we both, both the interpreters, we had to write it out real big. Like, what's the difference? You know, they were, they were different. Mm -hmm. Had a very different meaning, um, but yeah, there's there's. Um, I'm married to an interpreter, to, like as if it wasn't complex enough. I'm married to an interpreter who has been doing this for 20 years, no interruptions, over 20 years now. Wow. And she also gets tripped up on words too. So she has, I think it's broker is one of her words, but it's I think yeah. it's perfect. I think it's a great thing to explain to. Uh, young interpreters or people who are just getting out of school it's it's par for the course yeah yeah for sure and um the last one is if you could if you could name a favorite podcast the illusionist illusionist yes i think i, I think yeah. i've heard of that one. Oh, um, helen zaltzman oh it's oh you, oh yeah. word lovers love <laughs> oh, thank you so much this was really fun Thank you for agreeing to do it and to be broadcast to the world on the podcast. I will let you know. I'm hoping it's going to come out in May, but thank you. This was, this was really fun. I'm, I'm very impressed that you are doing a podcast. I just have to say that and get it out there because I find it, the whole idea of it daunting and I know what it takes to do editing just for a five minute clip for voiceover work. And I'm just thinking, how are you possibly going to edit this is amazing. I mean, congratulations. Yeah. And if I can help you at all, let me. Oh, oh well, thank you. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks. And good luck with everything. If I can be of any help, let me know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ciao. Bye. Bye. Join me and the rest of the crew at Seven Sisters Interpreter Training and Consulting as we do a live debrief of this episode. It'll be on our YouTube page on August 12th at 4 p.m. That's a Wednesday, August 12th at 4 p.m. on our YouTube page. We hope you can join us.